What's up, everybody? Welcome to Puzzle Huddle with Experts. Matthew Goins again. I'm here with Dr. Johnny Clarkson. Uh, we're excited to, to have a discussion. Johnny is a now a PhD uh, in education. He's a, <laughs> he's a performer. He's an award-winning teacher. Uh, he's a Detroiter. Uh, he's a lot of good things. He's a, he's a husband and a father, so a well-rounded experience, and I hope to kind of pull some information and insight from him, uh, specifically with his PhD in research, uh, because I think that insight is going to help a lot of us uh, have better outcomes in our schools, in our families, and with our children. So uh, without further ado, well, welcome, Dr. Clarkson. Hey, brother. Thank you so much, man. CT fired up, man. So I had to throw that out there. Shameless plug. <laughs> just, just, just in case I mischaracterized your PhD, what, what, what is it that you get that you earned your PhD in? So I got mine. I have an ED, uh, ED, uh, ED. And mine is basically in uh, educational le leadership with a concentration in urban studies. Um, I've been in urban education for the past, let's say, good grief, 11 years. And what I'm noticing is that the educational experience that children inside of Black and Brown communities, whether it be socioeconomic struggles or just those that don't have the resources of other people, what are their needs? What are their demands? How do we bridge that gap? Because I've always believed this statement to be true that although you may come from nightmarish circumstances. It does not mean that you lose the ability or the power to dream or that your dream should not be allowed to come true. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going off my script already. You as a black male educator, mm -hmm. as I understand it, black, black men aren't, don't rush into the education profession. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> What is it? What 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 was going on in your, your psychology that kind of drew you into education as a professional? So the re how I became a teacher was that I was leaving nonprofit and worked in nonprofit for a good majority of time and was in a bit of a transition. And my dad was like, you know, listen, you would be a really great teacher. And of course, I played it off for the longest. No, I'm fine. I'm not really that interested in it. And sure enough, um, my best friend, um, rest in peace, he came and grabbed me from a job I was doing in nonprofit wise. He said, you need to come here and teach social studies. All the stuff that you say and happy hour knowledge, these kids really need this inside of our schools. And I taught year one and I was hooked ever since. So it was literally the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, in terms of just unpackaging some additional notes from your portfolio of uh, credentials and, and, and background and what, what, what were some of the other things that you are trained to do professionally or had some professional experience doing? So I went to school uh, and majored in theater arts and speech communications and I actually left school for about a year and acted professionally and I mean I absolutely loved the fact I was able to act professionally and this is during the time I was at, um, at Dillard, shout out HBCUs, um, but literally being able to act professionally, be able to get that really great training. Um, when I came back, I was able to get a really cool um, internship at Comedy Central. So really kind of understanding like writing and what does that look like? Um, then I thought that I was going to possibly go into an MFA program, um, get my master's in fine arts and especially in acting. Hurricane Katrina came and changed everything drastically. That's how I ended up in the DC area working in nonprofit and all those things kind of helped me along the way because I feel that there are often times in the middle of teaching, I, I will jump into, you know, performing and laughing and really kind of getting the students engaged. And I think that's, that's the reason why so many students um, dislike school because it's a lot of sit and get. Somebody's always lecturing at you and it's like, well, I want to talk or I want to be engaged. And I, I, and I think that's, we missed the boat. Yeah, teaching in terms of uh, classroom control and and it, it is part performance. You, you, you got to have a, a really core skill set in terms of just uh, getting getting everyone's attention, keeping everyone engaged. It, it is not for um, th those people that are uncomfortable in front of crowds and uncomfortable in front of cr big rooms of people. It, 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 you, you'll you'll need that skill set to be effective. I think. Yeah, it's it's this. Like I, I've always known with this this theory that how are you introduced to like learning? You're introduced to learning with this big yellow bird and these, these people, these Muppet people that talk and they're, they're showing you letters and there's music and there's counting and it's, you're so overly engaged. Then all of a sudden you get to school and it's boring and you're like, yo, Sam, I've been tricked. Where the bird at, man? Where the where bird learning? Where are these people at that was 
but had me right, all engaged. Right. So now you're seeing this horrible falling out of love of school. Like, man, it broke my heart the day that my son straight up came in school and, and came in from school. It's like, I hate school. And I went, damn, it happened. And it, I thought that it could be beat, but I realized what had happened, the engagement that he needed was no longer there. It wasn't the fact of him being lazy or he's not willing to do the work. It's the fact that that engagement was not hitting him. And now it became something that he hated. What was it that you were resistant to? You mentioned that your father encouraged you to be a teacher and that you had a, a good friend that also encouraged you. But why, why wasn't it, why, why were you hesitant to pursue that as a, as a career? Because because honestly, I'm just gonna call it what it is. I hated most of my teachers growing up. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sorry, you know? Like, I mean, you know, I think about, you know, the wonderful world of, of Miss McCormick. I think about Mr. Washington, who was a brilliant uh, history teacher. Um, at Ludington, there was Mr. Hunt. Ooh, that's it. You know, that's three. I'm telling you that out from K through 12, there were three teachers I was interested in that that really engaged me. So now you're saying be one of these people because <laughs> then you yeah. Cause I, I was like, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't fit into that mode. I'm not boring. Um, I don't want to stick to this, this um, monotony. So yeah, man, I went, I went interested. Yeah. It sounds like a, a, maybe a concern that you might get boxed in or just kind of. Just... Absolutely. Yeah. 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 If, if I was a very outgoing person and excited about, you know, entertaining and performing, and, and I think this teacher thing is going to be dry and boring. Like why, why go sign How up? How would you do that? it? Yeah, why would why would you do it? It, it? it would really be kind of a wash. And that's kind of where I felt. I was like, man, this is going to be a huge wash for me. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to be bothered. I just really don't want to be bothered. Well, how, how do you find support to kind of reconcile who you are at, in your personality and this teacher job that it, it doesn't have? How, how do you make the two work? How, how do you able to, to unleash your, your cre creativity? By, by, by always pointing to the scoreboard. You know, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Anywhere that I've gone, I've always boosted test scores. I've always boosted uh, in student engagement. I've always boosted the number of kids that attend college. So though it may be unpredictable and nothing that you can quote unquote find in a research educational journal, um, the numbers don't lie. You know, when I, I, I say this all the time that when places that I've taught Man, I got problems with kids attending my class. That's not my problem. I got problems with kids uh, failing my course. That's not my problem either. Well, what, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to show you what I'm doing. The question is, are you comfortable with stepping outside of the box and realizing that what you think education is compared to the style of education that our children need might not be the same thing. You know, Inside of urban, urban education, we have students that receive special, special education services. Uh, we have students that are not reading on grade level, students who are um, emotionally disturbed. And if you don't have customer service or can identify with people consistently, psh, it's gonna be problematic. So yeah, that's, that's how I've been able to be successful. It's just yeah. always making sure the scoreboard always says I win. <laughs> I've never taught professionally, but from what I hear from teachers is some of the outside of the classroom requirements, the administrative things, the testing things can create some sandbags that, uh, right. that don't make teaching as fun or as, 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 as vibrant as it could be. Do, right. do you have some of those same challenges just dealing with you know, non-teaching requirements that could kind of be, make your work <laughs> sluggish? It, it's funny as bro, because they they are they non-teaching but they are teaching and i know you're like come on what do you mean by that right we're in this world where standardized test is king you know there are two major standardized tests that everybody deals with which is the park and the nwea yeah, nwea and these are tests that gauge growth and how students have growth throughout the grade and growth throughout the school year these tests for me don't really build capacity for students. They really teach students how to take tests, but they don't really teach students how to learn and how to create. 
Um, I've often said that I wonder inside of the way education is structured, are we building the next great inventor? And at times, I don't think we are. I think we're just building a lot of really great employees that are good at taking tests. And that's not how we're going to ever grow as a society. So that, that to me is one of those elements that's so problematic. What's your favorite subject to teach? Oh, it's, it's easily history. It's easily history. No matter, no matter what school, you, no matter what it is, history, the history teachers are the cool kids. And if you have a bad history teacher, he, should be, he or she should be fired immediately. So what 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 topics and what time frames and cultures like what 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 is what's exciting about teaching history? I love sitting inside of Civil War America. And the reason why is because Civil War America is like the it's the fine china that you set on a, a student's table before the main course come, which is the civil rights movement because the Civil War is really the first building blocks inside of what the Civil Rights Movement is gonna be. Here we have a group of formerly enslaved Africans that are fighting for their freedom when they've been told due to a, a, the Supreme Court that they are nothing more than property. And so much so that even if you are free, that at one time or another that um, a white man can grab you, bring you back down South, and enslave you yet again. So now that's this civil fight that the enslaved African has to have with the country and the country has to have this fight with itself to say, what's more important, the freedoms of all people or continuously to generate this overly popular, overly successful capitalistic society. And even a hundred years down the line, that's the battle inside the civil rights movement as well too. So the, I, I love that. I love when we get we get to it. If, the, if this is your if this is a space where you've done a lot of thinking, expand it out for me in terms of your age appropriateness. You know, take take the civil war to me for kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Because what you described, my, I don't know, but it sounds like probably a, a high school level of engagement. But how how do we how do we put that in place in elementary school and in, in, in pre elementary school? But you know what it is, bro? Don't get tricked. It's not a overly uh, complicated concept. All children understand fair. Like if you, if you look at a lot of kindergarten fights and why kindergartens tell the teacher, well, the first thing they say is, well, Johnny hit me and that wasn't fair. She did this and that wasn't fair. That other did this and that wasn't fair. Sit in fairness. Do you think it's fair for someone to work for someone else and then th and that person not get paid? Well, tell me why you think that's not fair. Well, believe it or not, there was a time inside of our country where there's a large population of people who were taken from their land, brought somewhere else, forced to work, and they weren't getting paid. Do you think that's fair? That's a that's a super chop down kindergarten concept yeah. and a lot of kids will go well yeah I don't think that's fair at all and just discuss the history of it right there on the surface you and did then, a good job of that walking that right down to kindergarten yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even warn you I was going to ask you that but you took no, that down no, to kindergarten it, it, but that's that's and, and that to me is what good teaching is is that um and and I think that's also the um the classism that happens in education all the time. Stop trying to impress people with these billion dollar SAT words that you happen to learn or because you got some app that you need to throw in this word every day to sound smart. Your, the education of our people rests, rules and abides in our ability in its simplicity of it and never for the educator to look down on the large masses and declare themselves to be the smartest person in the room. No one cares about that. No one cares about that at all. Yeah, so when you get bored, please um, uh, put that into a children's book uh, so we can all <laughs> <laughs> so that we can all buy uh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and we can have a you know an age appropriate level of conversation with our our kindergartners and first graders so that they can right. to some of these these concepts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you you've worked in education not only in a school environment but in nonprofit and performing arts. Right. Uh, and drama and stage. What have been some of just like the best 
learning mechanisms or vehicles or modalities that you've that you've engaged that you've seen same same things that that the same things that you scroll through and laugh about on your social media posts are the same things that i'm gonna put inside of classrooms um and i think that so during um election i think it was probably when we uh, this is probably one of my favorite lessons of all time that i've taught which is about who should be the leader of black america during this period of late 1800s into the 1900s and the kids had to choose between frederick Douglass, w du bois booker t washington or marcus garvey and i divided them all into like various camps so kids had you know the art the art kids they were responsible for what? Creating these beautiful artistic posters. The kids that were really great at writing speeches, they wrote these beautiful speeches. And these kids that were loving music, they wrote, they did a whole battle rap series. And I mean, like they ciphered up as these historical characters. And I'm, I'm, I know that I actually won an award for that. God, that, that doesn't even sound, seem that long ago. But it really blew everyone's mind. Like, how did you get all these kids to do this? And I went, because you play into people's intelligence, right? Like, I, um, that's, a, that's a failure of education. We're, we're so big, busy telling people you should learn only one way. And you can't, everyone doesn't learn the same way. Oh, no way. Yeah. And, and if you, you keep telling me to learn this way, what you're doing is you're alienating me from education. And after a while, I say, well, I don't even want it. Yeah, I, I think that's likely a consequence of us trying to scale education and kind of a do do it on a mass education level. It has to kind of be something that can be repeated. So we we try not to be as creative and nuanced and individualized in our education. It's just right. this, this mass marketed product that we just have we have to serve as many students as possible quickly uh, to get them through the the grade levels of, according to their age. And it's just like go through the machine, uh, which is not necessarily effective uh, for every student. No, we, we got to stop having um, horror movie theories to educate children. And what I mean by that is that uh, first grader, silver bullet, uh, wooden steak, uh, garlic, like we, we're we variety, right? You know, there's kids come from different experiences, so it's not going to work. So, you know, great teaching is you should be like Peyton Manning at the line of scrimmage. You should be able to read everybody in the room. All right, these are my kids that need things that are hands-on. These are my kids that like to talk. These are my kids that need some think time. They're not, they're not, this, this is not a disability that they're displaying. It's just that they need to see information chunk by chunk by chunk before they can give you a valuable response. Because if you notice, and this happened to us back in the day, Oh man, such such one of my favorite peach to one of my favorite teachers. And then everybody else would be like, man, I hate that teacher. But you had to realize the reason why those kids love that teacher, because that teacher was teaching only that way to the to the intelligences that they were great at. But if you're a hands-on kid, you're a kid that does this, you are gonna hate that class off the break. So what do you do outside of the classroom that keeps you because you're you're pulling from a lot of different things? What hobbies and activities do you have outside of you know your, your teacher role that kind of keep you fresh keep you loose keep you you know thinking open-minded and, and bringing in what it's, it sounds like some, something else is helping to keep you so it's so it's a free. lot of so inside of my master's program where i got my master's in um programs and curriculums and organizational development and i thought that was a really I, the, my master's of course of course, I'm super ha happy about being Dr. Clarkson, but I felt like the masters really kind of changed who I was as a teacher. I was teaching year one. It was great. But literally, after I got my masters, I felt like I just went to an aeroplane that was different because I understood that organizations have to be developed slowly, carefully, understanding how all people are different. And that's what allowed me to be really, really successful is that is that that understanding. Also, you know, playing sports as a kid, you know, you know, hey man, sudden such is good at this. So let that person do this. This person's good at this. Let them do that. And I think by honoring the differences in people without alienating the differences in people is how you build strong communities because kids don't learn 
in places that they don't feel safe. And safe does not always mean safety from violence, but safety sometimes means safe to, to process information differently than everybody else. Yeah, the, the, the pandemic, we, I, I think we saw some statistically, uh, some teacher turnover and some teacher burnout. Right. And, and, and it's easily to understand why. What, what have you done for yourself to make sure that you don't experience the same burnout and the interest in transitioning right. to something else? So for me, it's just the ability just to close my computer lid. Like, let me just watch um, some sports center. Let me watch a really good movie. Let me watch something on Hulu. Let me spend time with my son, laughing, joking with him. Like being able to do those things really kind of centered um, my, my refresh button. Um, also, I, and I, teaching is super emotional too. Like you really give of yourself every day. You know, when people say, oh, it's 180 days and you know, you guys get the rest of the summer off, but no, 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 it's bigger than that because there's things that you don't see as a parent that teachers give of themselves to make sure children are okay. But just kind of be able to refresh, you know, but also I think too, you to get great at this craft, you always have to be reading what does new research say. If you're running, if you like, I hate it whenever I walk into a, a room or it's professional development and someone says, I've been teaching for 20 years and I know everything I need to know. And that's, as soon as I hear that statement, I immediately just pick up my food, be like, it's nice meeting y'all. And I roll out because you, you have to have a growth mindset. You have to have, a, you've got to have a growth mindset. Okay, and fr fresh off the PhD, what is it that you study for your dissertation, your PhD dissertation? So my dissertation was in uh, is single sex education a viable solution um, in public schools? And what a reason why I, I leaned into this is because inside of private school models for the longest inside of our country, yeah. right? Oh yeah, private school models, single sex education has been dominant and has shown to be highly successful. My experiment was, or my, my dissertation was, I wondered if a public school modeled the same thing that um, a private school did with full fidelity, would there be growth? And I used three major, um, I used three major um, points. I looked at the NWA testing, the park, and I looked at grade point averages as my, my pressure points to see if there would be a, a major change. And I use a single sex male class, a single sex female class, um, uh, the co ed students that were male, co educational students that were male, and co educational students that were uh, female. Yeah, what I, so, so I haven't done this research, but off the top of my head, I'm guessing that there's probably a difference in, in, in age, right? So kindergarten, first grade, second grade, it might just all be a wash because uh, right. there's not enough gender difference at that point in time or, or the roles they're engaging. But as you get, older, maybe high school, is, is that the point of inflection where same gender classrooms starts to make more of a difference? Well, it's really, it's funny because I did my research with eighth graders. And I mean, the, 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 the percentage and points gaps were huge. I mean, as far as who was being successful compared to who was not being successful. I mean, when I say they were huge, it were really, really startling to see how, how much better our boys did, especially compared to single sex and compared to co-education. Um, and, and I, and I want to say that there was a, there's a little bit of a theme. And the reason why we don't do, well, the research show, let me be careful why I say this, the, the, the research that I did show is that we might be each other's worst enemy. In terms of gender? Yeah. So like the guys are too busy trying to impress the young ladies in the class. Therefore, I'm not really focused on my education. And some guys may decide I want to dumb myself down because I don't want to be picked on by certain guys. Same thing with our young ladies. Um, I don't want to be too, too smart because therefore the guys might not be interested in who I am. And also, um, I might lose friends. We at times sometimes, and this is what the research, my research showed, that we at times may suffer from herd mentality. 
I don't want to be the star in the sky because then I, I've alienated myself. We like being around each other. We like common causes and common themes. So yeah, it's, it's bad. Yeah, and at the, the, at the higher education level, it would be hard to argue against the value and the merit of the, the, the models that we have at Morehouse and Spelman. Like they're, they're just really good in terms of those niches and right. our exceptional graduates. Like it's just, right. it's really like you, you, it would be hard to find a Spelman or a Morehouse alum that you weren't impressed with. Like just, right. just kind of universally like brother, sister, with the Morehouse and Spelman. They, Morehouse, Spelman, Bennett, you're just seeing these, you know, these group and it's, but also there is a social backlash too. That is, well, now that I've been around nothing but this one you know this one sex how do i interact with opposite sex sometimes it's kind of awkward sometimes it's kind of weird so being able to talk to friends that went to morehouse spelman bennett dartmouth and they said well you know listen um i had some problems like when i got into you know my old you know 20s and so dating was difficult for me um working in public sectors working with people that were you know the opposite sex it was difficult for me so it's it's not it's a little column A, a little column B, but I think that it was a very interesting research topic for me, and I thoroughly enjoyed it though. I really, really did. Yeah. How does all this information influence how you parent? Now that you you have this PhD insight, you have your professional experience as a teacher, and your your drama, your acting, all these different things. How does all this stuff boil up as, as in terms of how you behave as a parent? Right? What are you doing in parenting based on all of this stuff? Make in, in, as far as parenting, as far as teaching make well-rounded decisions so for example when i go when i said earlier about making sure there's things for students that learn hands-on learn make sure there's things for students that are better listeners maybe students for the need to write things that need people extra think time because that's what it is is that you need to provide a well-rounded experience as a teacher i'll tell you the other thing that it made me do too is that it made me very cognizant of how i decide to dish out punishment for students as well too. Um, for a lot of our boys, when our boys do something wrong, man, just, and this is just inside of public education, we throw the hammer at them, geez. Like there's very, it's a very slow pathway to a road for forgiveness. And that sucks because it's like, if I already hate this place, but also when I do something wrong, you kill me for it? man, I can't stay in this place even more. You know, the popular research says that guys and boys and girls will do the same thing, but boys will be punished at like two times tougher than our young ladies. And I don't think that, and then also too, being very, so that's one end for my young ladies. I, wrote, I am big on awarding young ladies for talking. And this is the reason why, because unfortunately research girls who talk a lot and i'm you know i don't know what type of show you have so i'm gonna say it you can edit this out but <laughs> girls who talk a lot are labeled as bitchy bossy you know what i'm saying and i'm like yo she's in the fourth grade she can't be a bitch you know that's rough you know what i'm saying like how did her wanting to express who she is make her the b word just that quick so for me i'm like Young lady, what you got to say? And she, she can take all the airspace she needs. Oh, that's what's up. Thank you so much for sharing that. I didn't think about it like that. Because what it is, is that she doesn't need me to define her as a woman. But what I should do as a young lady, but what I should be doing is providing her the right space where she can develop and grow and not punishing her because she's paying attention. Yeah, it takes a real, it takes a teacher really paying attention and, and having the freedom in the space. So, so not overwhelmed with a lot of other things uh, so that they can have the, the brain and the, and the emotional space to pay right. attention to their students to, to unlock right. some of these things. Because if you're just so busy with uh, those administrative tasks, it, it prevents you from being as detail oriented related to in, in your classroom size and, and workload and some of those other things that might uh, prevent you from being as focused on each student as, as you potentially could be. Right. I want to go back, back to mental health just for just a moment because I'm I'm not a an administrator. What can parents do from you know just our little uh, humble positioning in the in the whole ecosystem? Right. What can parents do to help support the mental health 
uh, of the teachers of our kids so that you know so that we can help ensure they don't get burned out and we can help ensure that you know they're not unnecessarily transitioning to other careers maybe some teachers should transition to other careers but right uh, no 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 <laughs> this thing ain't for this thing ain't for everybody trust me i got 10 teachers that shouldn't be teaching right now and the following is not mess with you <laughs> <laughs> here are the names uh, <laughs> scroll the names right here <laughs> what for, for for those teachers that are, should be teaching like this is what they're they're passionate about this is where they're excited this is what they have the training to do uh and, and if they could just find more support what what can us as parents do to help make sure our teachers are are thriving the main thing is to understand that um we're not the enemy we're your teammate um and i i, I want to be very careful in that i have seen something really weird happen inside of education where it's parent and kid versus the teacher and that's not how we're going to win you know there is a robbery that's taking place and this robbery is the injustice that happens amongst black and brown children all the time i don't need um an ally i want an accomplice and the, what we're going to do is we're going to steal our kids futures back from a society that says that they're washed and they have nothing to do with it. So I need parents to partner better with teachers. Join your local PTO, PTA, Parent Teacher Organization, your local Parent Teacher Association. Mm -hmm. That helps build that support in. But also at home parents, um, the number one thing you can do is stop asking your kids family feud questions when they get into the car. How's your day, how's your day today? Fine yeah that's a bridge that leads to nowhere like that kid really may be hurting inside or really having to get go at it but they they have a program default answer inside their mindset how are you doing today fine like you know with my son hey what's going on tell me something you love tell me something you like tell me something you love something you hate it and something you're gonna change for tomorrow because what i'm doing now is i'm building out rapport so then what happens is that i'm asking my son to be more um intentional in how he handles the day and how he handles problems like when he knows that he sees me and he knows those three questions are there as soon as he gets in the car he's like let me tell you what went right today dad blah blah blah, yeah. blah, blah. i'm like oh man let me so, so now what what happened is that over time those i don't even those questions don't even exist anymore and i literally defaulted to an original question how's your day today he talks for about eight nine minutes yeah get, getting more of our out of our kids yeah that that car ride home for those of us that that are using yeah. that mode of method of transportation it seems, seems to be a great time to unpackage um uh, what happened during the day it, yeah it, like that that whole that whole unpacking of the day because you know to, on pie chart your teachers spend more time with your children than you do and that's kind of scary to think about. Yeah. So therefore, you're trying to play catch up, and you can't uh -huh. call your you can't call all your child your all your children's uh, teachers back. How they do today? All right, man. What they do today? Was that cool? Did they do this? Uh, like it's too much. It's too cumbersome. So you have to be very deliberate in how do you get to that information for your kids. Very deliberate. Yeah, and avoiding that adversarial role, I, I, I'm guilty of getting an email or seeing my children's uh, assignments marked up. And my first reaction was, wait, you took a point off of, the teacher took a point off of what? Right. Yeah. Like, hold on, that, that letter was capitalized. How, 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 how are we going to talk about, this is a capital? So, so yes, uh, de defaulting it and, and maybe even preemptively establishing a relationship with the teacher uh, so that, you know, when, the, when different things happen, that might be a surprise. This isn't your first engagement with the teacher. But but also, too, teachers have to be better in how we engage parents. So I believe that there are three phone calls you got to make throughout the, school, throughout the school year. You got to make sunshine calls, which is, man, such such is doing really good today in school. Okay. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Like that's a, a teacher should, should if you have if you're listening to this right now and your child's teacher has never given you a sunshine call. I'm sorry. I'm just going to call it right there. That's bad teaching because if they do something bad, you write on the phone. Da, da, da. Man, little Gianni is out here wilding. You throwing chairs, <laughs> you yelling, who came? You know, like, you're going to kill me. So, like, 
you can't, you got, got to keep that same energy, right? If they doing something good, man, Lil Gianni is out here. He's doing really good. He got an A on his spelling test. I'm so proud of him. I see him working hard every day. All right, mom, dad, I'll holler at you later. Click. Yeah, he little Obama in here today. He little Obama in here, man. We Yes, we can <laughs> and everything, right? But you can't say, you can't kill him for this and not praise him for that. Because what happens is that you're real, that child's really not interacting in what I would say, an honest space. They're, what they're doing is they're only doing the right thing out of fear all the time. Man, I don't want miss. I don't want. I don't want Doctor Clark to call my mama because you know he's gonna go in. And I, I've even told my students, I, and I, this is uh, this is a trust exercise I have with my students. I tell them all the time. I was like, listen, if you've been having a tough go at it, right at home, you've been you've been messing up. You ain't been taking out the trash. You've been failing, doing some wild stuff, right? Do this. If you got a, a good on Fridays, you have a good grade in my class. Email me like, hey, can you call my parents this weekend? I need some help. I'm a play. I'm, hey, what's going on? Yeah, this is Dr. Carson. Yeah, man, let me tell you something, man. Greg out here killing the game right now, man. I'm really proud of that young man. He's doing this. Hey, man, I'm just calling to let you know Hillary out here killing the game right now. So, you know, I hope that she's doing great in all her other classes, but she's doing really great in my class. Because what happens is I'm now balanced it out. Maybe right. Look, look, the the founder of Nickelodeon, and I can't think of her name right now. She said the reason why Nickelodeon is was so successful in the orange years is because we were the first network to acknowledge not the kids want to have fun, that growing up being a kid sometimes is hard. We have this um uh bad quarterback memory of thinking that I work, I walk 12 miles to school and I got all A's and everything else. And what you do is you take these uh, these false memories or false ideology, pour them onto your children. Now your kids think they got to be perfect when you were near, nowhere close. So we got to remember sometimes that being a kid was tough. And by doing that, we endear ourselves more to our students. Yeah. All right. The, the, the last thing I think I want to ask you is about black black male teachers and how do we increase the pipeline uh, for those that might have an interest or a passion or, or the skill or, you know, the, the word with the, that might be interested in doing it. No, no. want to push falsely push people into it that aren't aren't going to aren't going to be a good fit. But those that would be a good fit and may have some interest. How do we in, what are some things that you think we can do to increase uh, interest in, in, in males becoming teachers? Ooh, this is where you, you, this is probably where this show about to get canceled right here. I'm sorry, Matt, my bad, bro. Um, it's not a me and you problem. It's, I'm, I'm just going to say it. It's not a me and you problem. And I'm trying to waltz this in very carefully. There has to be a conversation that Black men are important. And we're going to actively recruit them. We're going to actively retain them. We're going to give them the um, training that they need. They fall short. And we're going to tell them that we appreciate them. We're going to appreciate them as teaching artists. We're not going to make them disciplinarians. Yeah. And we're not going to make them the serious people in the building. Right. Because a black male teacher in a, in a, in a, in a school, first, likely the coach. Uh, second, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the disciplinarian, the one that, you know, uh, gets called on the PA to come deal with pr problematic situations. Yep. Let me come get like, like literally when I think about my black male teachers, there's my fifth grader is Mr. Wright. Seventh grade, there is Mr. Hunt. Eighth grade, I didn't have one, you know. So that meant that K through eight, I had what, three? No, two. Jesus, two. And it, that's. That, that's not going to get it done, but there are people that have to look around the room and understand that that's a problem and actively want to do something about it. Not in lip service, but really actively want to do something about it. Because usually when I meet a black male, a, a black man that's leaving education, I say, well, why are you leaving? They never say the kids. 
They never say the kids. I love the kids. I love the kids. I love what I do. I don't feel appreciated. I always feel like I'm under attack. They, they, I never can be a teaching artist or be a teacher. It's always, we need you to discipline, it, discipline uh, such and such. And I'm disinterested. In fact, I, I remember my first year, and this is, I'm, I mean, I, I, I remember this memory so fresh that my first year in this new school that I was at, I'm, I'm killing it. You know, I'm killing it. Like, got the best grades in the entire school and all my kids are making gains. I got kids that weren't reading. Now I have grown two, three grade levels. I'm, I mean, I got a kid that's going to test out of special education. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. out here killing it, right? And this woman said to me, well, the only reason, and I want to be real careful how this sentence lands, the only reason why these kids are performing so well for you is because you know these kids ain't got no dad. Jesus. Really? Come on, fam. That, that's reaching. Yeah. That's reaching. But it's but it's it's also insulting because what you're saying is the hard work that you've done, the building relationships, um, your level of education that don't have nothing to do with the fact that these kids are doing well. Is it the fact that fam, you can stand in peace? Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> that discredits a lot of different yeah. things that are playing a role. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It it there has to be a moment of clarity, a moment of honesty where people say, we need them. They're part of our landscape, they're part of our soundtrack of what makes a really successful school. And we're going we're going to make it happen. Okay, I wanted to. I'm gonna change just to, to end on like uh, a more positive, fun, fun. Uh, right, right. Let's get it. Yeah. So what? All right. What? What? What might have been some of your favorite books as a child? For you to have been a history buff, you know, right? Going into drama eventually and teaching. Like, what were some of the things that were influencing you as a kid that are like hallmark experiences that really set the? Oh path? man, I mean, my favorite books was easily Jubilee. Uh, Go Tell on a Mountain, Black Boy, Native Son, but probably the book that, and then people laugh about this all the time, but the book that really like meant a, a lot to me was The Killer Mockingbird. And um, I think because a lot of people don't really understand what that book is really about. Like To Kill a Mockingbird is really a book about the how to treat people well. Like it's really about it is, that. Like, it is. you know, like, mockingbirds have no natural enemies mockingbirds go out of their way to do nothing but make the world better and i try to live my life very much so like a mockingbird that wherever i touch wherever i go i'm making the world better in everything that i do so that when people throw stones at me say things that are crazy they kind of look at you and go of all people you're going to talk about you're going to talk about g like come on man like i need you to do better and, and think about what you're doing while you're, while you're saying these things. Um, I pass this lesson off to my students is that, you know, leave things better than you found them. Um, yeah. Growing up, you know, grow up in a church, you know, there's a saying, you know, life is a mirror of a king and a slave is just what you are and do. So give to the world the best that you have and the best will come back to you. So it's like really understanding like, what does it mean to be this mockingbird, what does it really mean to have this Sankofa mentality, which means that as I climb, I'm always reaching back and pulling someone along the way. So that, you know, I, I, I tell my friends or I tell my students this all the time. If it's lonely at the top, it's because you ain't bring nobody with you. You can't take everybody. But if it's lonely at the top, it's because when you was lifting, you didn't bring nobody with you. So yeah, when people sit back with this, you know, fake boss mentality, man, it's lonely at the top. It's just what it is. It's a cold world out here. Yeah, yeah. you 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 missed the mark, fam. Because you may be here, you know, sending VIP, but man, those drinks would have tasted a lot better if your boys was there, if your girls was there. Yeah, let, let me let me just toss a, a little micro question because I'm 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 struggling. Or I, I spend a lot of time now thinking since I'm talking to so many experts about 
you know, social development, emotional development. So, mm -hmm. so academics is one thing that our ch children need to develop in. But when you have these single gender classroom experiences, school experiences, what, what are they getting in terms of social emotional development that might be also a benefit in addition to that, you know, the, the GPA and some of the other things that you said you were measuring as a part of your, your dissertation research? Right. So for me, it's, it's really kind of like building brotherhood and building sisterhood. Like we all we got. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's something about what well, we all we got mentality. You know, when you look across the room, you know, and we learn this a lot of time in sports, you learn this a lot of time in any group activity. When you look around a huddle and you go, listen, man, we all we got. You know, it, it is a little Detroit versus everybody. It is those kind of, those, those, that my, mindset of, if I know this is all I have, then I'm going to treat these things a lot differently. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you only got one good pair of shoes, you're going to take care of them uh, clean. Them to be the cleanest, oldest pair of J's in the world. But you're going to take care of them. So when you're in a huddle with people and you say, man, this is all I got. I ain't really got time to be petty towards you or hold grudges. But I do have time to be forgiving, to be understanding. I have time to grow you because I know that I only have one of you. And I, and I think that if that mentality was taken more globally inside our societies, we'd be very um, hesitant in grabbing a gun to solve everything, you know, or, or finding the worst solution possible to tell people, I ain't the one to be played with. Come on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, that's the emotional maturity that we all need. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not high level conflict resolution. Get, get in there. If that that's not the starting place for for effectively resolving the conflict. No, it's it's it, it it's not. And then also too, and I, I think I said this in our group, <laughs> you know, if we're on Facebook, is that I am not gonna punish nobody uh, at 41, 42 years old for a version of themselves at 15, 16. You know, that's 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 a little silly. Yeah, we're we're far from you. You yeah, would have like, covered a lot of ground in those years. Yeah, like you, you, you're still trying to figure out so much stuff. And then you know, it's funny because like I hear people say, "Man, I don't mess with such and such." Oh, okay, why well, mess with such and such? Now I'm gonna tell you what they did. Third period, <laughs> ninth grade, Doctor McDougal's class. It's like, fam, yeah. <laughs> you had a lifetime of experiences, and you're literally gonna take this person to this minuscule moment like their their portfolio of life experience is so much broader so yeah i'm not i'm not going to i'm not going to live a life that limits me and limits me away from people because of a version of themselves that's you know yeah that many years ago and and if you if if you were to bring it up to them at this age and this level of mature they would probably apologize and say or, I didn't you know what the worst part about it is and they probably wouldn't even remember yeah. that's the that's the dagger they probably wouldn't even remember but you're right <laughs> so that's awesome that you know we can see that growth all right bro, bro i've held you for so, so much time and i'm I, and i thank you for hey man i mean uh, i appreciate you brother look i gotta tell everybody please like the video subscribe to the channel so that we can keep you engaged with our content thank you dr clarkson uh congratulations on your phd and i'm glad you have this no drama history this, <laughs> this public speaking and you're rolling all of this up into a teaching profession because our kids are surely the, the beneficiaries of it hey man brother i'm truly humbled man buy this man's puzzles man if you ain't <laughs> buying his puzzles man they they clutch one day i'm gonna get on the puzzle i gotta do about four or five more dope things and they're gonna be a dr clarkson puzzle i'm gonna tell you this much those puzzles is huge man plus the cognitive i can explain the benefits of why black children should have these puzzles but there's cognitive reasons of why i'm working with their hands being able to accomplish your goals, even if they're, listen, you can buy one and that's fine. You buy multiple, it's even better because what it does is it's a history of accomplishments. There's endorphins that you actually release when you complete a puzzle. A lot of people don't know that. And those endorphins are the same equivalent of a roller coaster ride or getting an A on a test. Absolutely. It, it, it gives you a little puzzle high. It, it, it gives you a puzzle, <laughs> puzzle high, man. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, audience. We love you. And I appreciate you spending a little time with us. Hey, brother. Thank you.